This video will have an overview of participles and what they do, as well as an overview and preview of the whole Greek participle system. It goes with sections 65 and 68 of Hansen and Quinn's Greek and Intensive Course, which you will find on pages 203 to 204 and on page 212 of Hansen and Quinn. So let's talk about what participles are first in English. If we have bad Helen, we can express that in Greek as he kake helene. And what we have here are adjectives, bad and kake, that describe, that give you information about Helen. They agree with her in case number and gender in Greek. Adjectives can modify nouns that are the subject of the sentence or, at, or nouns that are in some other part of the sentence. So bad Helen frees little Leo. We get another adjective little telling us more about Leo and we can say that in Greek as well. Hekake Helene ton mikron leon ta lue. So look at those adjectives and see how they are sitting there in attributive position giving us more information about those nouns. Now let's look at another sentence with some other descriptors of Helen and Leo. Laughing Helen frees cowering Leo. Those are both still adjectives telling us more about Helen and Leo, but within their meaning they have some verbal ideas, and that's what a participle is. A participle is a verbal adjective. So laughing Helen frees cowering Leo has two active participles telling us more about Helen and Leo. In English, to make an active participle, you're going to add ing most of the time to whatever the verb is. We could also say embarrassed Helen frees guarded Leo. Again, we've got two words that modify, that tell us more about these two nouns. They are acting as adjectives, but they have verbal ideas in them. And those endings there in English tell us that these are passive participles. Helen having been embarrassed, perhaps, or Leo having been guarded. You can hear the passiveness of embarrassed and guarded. So again, these are adjectives with verbal aspects to them, and these are passive ones. When you're thinking about active and passive, think about the noun that the verbal adjective is describing. And that noun is sort of the subject of that participle. So in an active participle, laughing Helen, Helen's the one who's doing the laughing. And in a passive participle, embarrassed Helen, Helen is the one who has been embarrassed. Helen, who was embarrassed, frees Leo, who was guarded. That's another way of thinking about what verbal adjectives are doing in English as relative clauses, and it would be helpful to think about them that way with some verbal adjectives, some participles in Greek. Participles can do more than just tell us more about a particular noun. They can tell us what's going on in the circumstances of the whole sentence. So in English, if I just even add a comma here, embarrassed, Helen Freeze guarded Leo, that can imply a whole circumstance. Since she is embarrassed, Helen frees Leo. And you might be able to tell even without the whole clause, just by the word embarrassed in context, that the relationship between that embarrassed and the rest of the sentence is one of cause. This is why she's doing it. And Greek participles are going to do things like that all the time. So now that we've thought a little tiny bit about how participles work in English, let me give you a preview of what we're going to learn about the Greek participle system, which is quite thorough. Greek has participles in the present, future, aorist, and perfect tenses in all three voices, and they will come from the principal parts you're used to. Everything present will come from principal part one. Everything future, active, and middle will come from principal part two. Everything aorist, active, and middle will come from principal part three. The perfect active participle will come from principal part four. 
the perfect middle and passive will come from principle part five. And of course, the air is passive and the future passive participles will come from principle part six. You will learn as you go over each of those tenses and voices of the participle how to translate them. But I'm going to give you a preview of that now because it's going to give you a sense again of how we express these things in English. So here are all four tenses and all three voices. The present active participle, the default translation is easily verbing. And we'll get that from principle part one. The middle, causing to be verbed. Whatever that participle is modifying, whatever it agrees with in case, number, and gender, because it's an adjective, will be causing to be verbed, causing something to be verbed, or whatever the middle meaning is. And again, that will be principle part one. Passive, being verbed from principle part one. The future is pretty special. It's intending to verb much more often than it is about to verb. So the future participle has the idea of purpose in it almost all the time, not just the sense of something that's going to happen in the future. And we'll talk about that more, of course, when I introduce those forms to you and as we learn how to use them. Principle part two for the active voice of the future participle. And we'll get the middle meanings there, intending to cause to be verbed or about to cause to be verbed from principle part two, and then intending to or about to be verbed from principle part six. I'm going to skip over the heiress for a second and go to the perfect. The perfect, as usual, has in it the idea of completed action. So the way we're going to express that in a default English participle is having verbed in the active voice from principle part four. In the middle voice, having cause to be verbed, you can hear the perfectness of it, the completed action, and that'll be from principle part five. Same with having been verbed, the passive version, from principle part five. Greek participles don't have an absolute sense of time associated with their tense, but they usually have some relative sense of time. So there'll be a main verb. Remember, these are verbal adjectives. These will never stand as the main verb of a sentence. So they will have a time relationship that's relative to the main verb of the clause that they're in. And so the present participle will be pretty much simultaneous time. Future participle, even with that purpose meaning, will be subsequent time after the main verb and the perfect will be completed relative to the main verb. Aorist, since English doesn't really have that, um, doesn't have as clear a way to say what's going on relative time. And you'll find that aorist participles, which are quite common, will have multiple ways to translate them depending on your context. So aorist could be verbing, just like um, the present tense. And that would be true all the way across, like the present tense. But here we're from uh, principal part three in the active and middle and from principal part six in the passive. There you can see that you wouldn't do it quite the same as the present passive. Being verbed carries that continuous aspect thing and verbed is more likely the passive translation of the aorist participle. But you can also, depending on the context and English idiom, translate the aorist participle exactly the same way as the perfect participle, having verbed, having been verbed, having caused to be verbed. And sometimes it's going to make more sense, depending on the context, to turn it into an English relative clause. Who verbed, who caused to be verbed, who was verbed. So here's a preview of the videos to come. You're going to get in section 66 the whole active participle system. And that will give you endings in four tenses. As I said, present, future, aorist, and perfect. All the cases, because these are verbal adjectives, and adjectives have to agree in case, in gender, so you'll get all masculine, feminine, and neuter endings, and in number, and you will get singular and plural. 
And then in video 67, we'll get the middle and passive system for those participles. All of those things again for the middle and passive voices. And then, and that's just the forms. 67 and 68 are how to do the endings. Then in video 69, you'll learn the attributive use of the participle. That's what we saw um, when the participle is in attributive position with the noun that it modifies. For instance, he lusa helene soze ton fulatomenon le anta. You can see there, he lusa helene and ton fulatomenon le anta, participle forms in attributive position with Helen and Leo, and it says, Helen freeing saves the guarded Leo. And then in video for section 70, you'll learn the circumstantial use of the participle. When participles aren't in attributive position, they can mean something quite different. They can do the whole circumstances of a sentence. They can stand in for whole clauses in English. Here we have Lusa he Helene soze ton leonta fulatomenon. And you can see that the participles, even though you don't know these forms quite yet, are in predicate position, are not in attributive position. That could mean while she is freeing, Helen saves Leo, although he is guarded. And I'll teach you all about that in the video for section 70. Now, those are two of the three uses of the participle in Greek, the attributive use and the circumstantial use. Later on, we'll also learn the supplementary use of the participle. That's the video for section 111, and that's not until unit 14. But that will be for situations with certain verbs where we can say things like, Hey, Helene, chaire, ton leonta, luusa. Helen enjoys freeing Leo. And that's an overview of participles, what they do, and the whole Greek participle system as it is presented in Hansen and Quinn and in my videos.